Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I've, I've already learned a lot from these previous talks, and there's going to be some overlap. Uh, I'll try and point it out. Oh, sorry, is it for recording? Yeah, you don't have to sound right up against it, but just... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and stay roughly in this area. Uh, right, so I've, uh, I've tried to prepare a talk about aspects of quantum information that sound like they should be important for people who are interested in, in making games uh, relating to quantum information. Uh, so a lot of it is just going to be about what is quantum information, uh, so what is information, uh, what is uh, quantum theory, I shall give you the overview. Um, so what is information, just classical information to start with, and then quite a lot about what's quantum theory. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about how to visualize uh, quantum theory, uh, which is very difficult. And uh, quantum information, which kind of links these two things. Uh, and then a few open problems at the end. Uh, if anything is unclear, just ask me, stop me at any point. Um, so one notion of information is, is to talk about surprise. Uh, and to view it as uh, a measure of surprise. So you know, maybe he, he's uh, found out that a share price has fallen. It's very hypothetically speaking. Um, and he's very surprised. Now, how can we quantify the idea of, of surprise? So an event uh, we can associate with the probability, uh, P. And then we could say, oh, the surprise of, the of this event is something like 1 over p. So if it's very unlikely, the, uh, the surprise is very large. But it's actually nicer to, to just add a log, take the log of this, um, for, for various reasons. One is that the log is additive. So if you have two independent events, then it turns out the surprise is going to be additive. Um, so you can say now, you could choose to define information as saying the amount of information you gain when you find out that an event is realized is the surprise, is this thing. And then the average surprise, the average information gain is given by this thing, which is called the Shannon entropy. Um, you remember this is standard formula for average, that you, you take the probabilities and then the thing here. Um, so... Another notion, which is related but not quite the same, is to think of information in terms of bits. So say we have a probability distribution again, uh, but this time it's going to be over some messages. Um, now, we're going to talk about how many bits do you need to store uh, a message. So what is a bit? Well, a bit is just is a set of two possible states. So one we label 0 and the other we label 1. Uh, an important thing is that if you have n bits, then you have two to the n possible states. We, uh, and vice versa, <laughs> if you have two to the n states, then you can uh, associate that with n bits by taking the log. So this formula is going to appear a bit below. So the log of the number of states gives you a number of bits. Uh, you could now instead define the amount of information in a message, instead of as the average surprise, average information gain, uh, you could define it as the number of bits that is needed to communicate the message. Um, and it's not exactly the same thing. But so, for example, now if you look at what is the actual number then? For, so let's say I have one out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight messages are possible. So then I need. Uh, eight states uh, to communicate this message. Um, I mean, this could be that I send it actively uh, to you by sending you a system, but it could also be that I just uh, encode this data in a system and as a memory, and then later you come and read the memory. It's the same thing. So how many states does this memory need? It needs eight, because all of these things are possible. So I'm saying it could be one out of these eight messages. Uh, and how many bits do you need to have eight possible states? Uh, you need 
the log of the number of states. Uh, so this is actually a, a different uh, measure of information of a distribution. So you take the log of the number of possible messages, and this thing is a different entropy. It's called the max entropy. So that's part of what people do in information theory uh, is think about what is the appropriate measure of information. And there's actually many different ones. Um, I feel like people looked a little bit confused about this one. Was this okay? Just ask if, uh, do ask if something is unclear. Um, oh, and now I wanted to move to quantum theory. And I had a little video, and it was slowing down the presentation, so I took it out. Um, so what's going to happen once it starts is that this is something called a double slit experiment. Um, the, you fire electrons, uh, for example, here. And there are two slits that, in principle, they could go through. If, the, if they were like classical particles, they would go through one or the other. And then the trajectory, you should imagine that it hits this screen over here. So imagine this is what's happening now, is that the sh something is shooting electrons here. Then what you find is on this screen you get these dots, um, which normally we think of it as one electron hitting the screen. Um, and this, this, it takes a little while to build up. But what's going to happen is there's going to be an interesting pattern here. So some of you will know what's going to happen. But it's still, I know, I know what's going to happen, but I still find it really surprising. Uh, and very hard to, to imagine why this is. So he talks about interference fringes. And what happens is you see kind of wave structure uh, that certain places are more likely than others to get hit. And in the end, you, you get this kind of pattern. And it's called an interference pattern. It's basically it's a wave. So that's why people sometimes talk about wave particle duality, because it's like a, a little ball in that every run of the experiments, you get one, one hit. But in terms of the actual statistics of the whole thing, it's like a wave. Um, So this is whole theory around understanding these phenomena called quantum theory. Uh, one way of formulating the rules, which is um, maybe a more modern one uh, that, than uh, what these guys were using. I, this is not all the people who started quantum theory. It's just photos I happen to have. Uh, Ms. Schrodinger and Einstein and Bohr. Uh, so. The rules are actually not that difficult. You take a, uh, a matrix, which you associate with a system, like the electron, and you call it the system's state. The matrix has complex numbers in it. And there are certain conditions uh, beyond that, but we don't need to go into exactly what those are. And this, this matrix you often denote as rho. Now, Measurement outcomes are also represented by matrices with complex numbers. We can call them A, for example. And now the probability of a measurement outcome for a given state, is, this is a very crucial rule, is given by this. So you multiply these two matrices together, and you take the trace, which just means you, take, you sum the diagonal elements of the resulting matrix. It's not that difficult in a way. Um, and there are, uh, you can change the state, you can evolve the state, uh, which uh, there are some rules concerning how to do that, but basically anything that keeps the theory self-consistent um, is allowed in principle. Um, now, one crucial thing for, for these video games, and uh, you were asking questions about this too, uh, is what you might call the state size problem. Uh, that, okay, if we look again at this, this rule, 
you have a matrix, rho. Now let's say it's size d by d. Now it turns out that d grows exponentially in the number of systems involved. Uh, and I think you can actually make a rigorous argument that it has to be like this because the quantum state assigns probabilities to all outcomes. Um, and the number of outcomes uh, actually grows exponentially in the number of systems. So this is even true classically. So I would say this, this exponential scaling is really, uh, seems to, ha it has to be there because quantum states are more like probability distributions. They give probabilities for all possible outcomes. Um, okay, so if, uh, how large, so I, I anticipated your question, Sama. Um, if you try to simulate a, a quantum system, uh, or if I do it on my laptop with, with MATLAB, then I find that if D uh, is something like 1,024, which is, it seems like an odd number, but it corresponds to 2 to the 10, uh, which is just 10 quantum systems of, of dimension 2, uh, then it becomes uh, very slow. <coughs> and you can do some tricks to try and get higher, like there was some guy at a workshop who specialized in that, and I think he could, uh, by using some very clever tricks, he could do maybe 20 or 25 on his laptop. Um, but you, but if you will get stuck. Um, okay, now the other part about quantum theory, which is very important here, is visualizing. Uh, so, you know, in classical mechanics, it's very neat because you can imagine that systems are like little balls that have well-defined momenta and positions. And it's very neat because you can visualize, for example, even though you can't see, say, the atoms in a gas, you can visualize the pressure as little balls hitting the wall and, and pushing on it, right? But in quantum theory, we don't have this, this nice picture. And to me, this is actually the, the major conceptual problem in, in quantum theory and therefore for, for science, for modern science, is that we, quantum systems are not little balls. Uh, and, but what are they? I don't think we really know. Um, so here's just another example that people often use. Um, you, you, um, you imagine a beam splitter. Um, if you shine a beam of light like this, some light will go that way and some light will go through. So some gets reflected, some goes through. Now you can link these up. Uh, these are mirrors. And it turns out that it's impossible to think of a quantum experiment like this consistently as saying that there is a, a photon or particle that takes a given path. I, I don't think I'm going to try and explain why exactly this is now, but it's, it's just if you try, you will find it's impossible. You cannot say that it, it goes one path or the other. You have to somehow say, oh, it, it somehow does both at the same time, whatever that means. Um, this is called the superposition. Okay, and then there's another way which has already been mentioned and is used in your game, uh, which is a, a beautiful and, and more abstract way. So it's, actually, it's, it's, it's not another way. It's the first way that I'm going to mention. Then I'm going to mention other ways. Um, so how do you do this? Well, you can, you can write this matrix rho for the state as a sum over complex matrices with real coefficients. So these are just real numbers. And uh, th these can be fixed matrices. So you just choose them as a set uh, of matrices that you're going to stick with. And therefore, the state is uniquely characterized by, by these numbers. So it's, it, you get a, a vector of real numbers. So the different i's for the different entries of the vector. Um, so you can actually represent this complex matrix, uh, which sounds like an exotic object, just as a real vector. So real meaning has real numbers, right? Um, so that's what's happening in this block sphere case. Um, is that you? It's the simplest version of this, uh, where each state is a is a vector. So each point on this sphere, for example, is a quantum state. 
Um, and changing a quantum state would be like you could start here, for example, and move the state to there. And the, you, when you apply the operation on all states at the same time, it would be like rotating the whole sphere. So it's quite a nice way of, of visualizing things. But a, a, a key problem is the state size problem, as already has been mentioned. Uh, that it's only the smallest systems that you can actually draw, draw in three dimensions. Uh, the, the ballerina is, um, we've done a paper which uh, talks about kind of spinning the block sphere and how it's similar. Okay, the paper doesn't talk about the ballerina. The blog mentions how this is similar to the ballerina spinning on her toe. Um, and the, it sounds a bit uh, random, but it's actually, it's like, the point is that there's friction. And this is, this is completely side now. Uh, there's a kind of locality restriction that turns out to be like friction on this plane. Uh, and therefore, the only way that quantum theory can rotate things is if it shrinks up the sphere so that it's, it's just on one point here. If it was like flat out, like a, a box, it would get stuck and it wouldn't be able to move. So only, only because it has this kind of shape can, can, can it move. That, that's, that's not, that wasn't what I was going to, fo going to focus on. Um, but it's just an example of how you can, you can make a mapping now between quantum systems and objects in, in 3D space. Um, okay, then uh, another thing which is, uh, has appeared in your talk in a way um, is that you can visualize quantum systems as like probability clouds or, or water uh, collections. So here we have uh, electron probability distributions of a hydrogen atom for different states. So high, high light means uh, high probability. Now, uh, you can also think of these things as, as uh, water collections. Um, and when you change the state, it's like water moving along, or, um, like actual waves. Um, it, this, this is actually a very powerful way of doing it. There are two issues still. So one is that it doesn't capture the intuition for why there's only one click when you, when you uh, d do a measurement. You know how the, the electron just created one dot? If it was really a wave, it would somehow splash everywhere, right? Uh, and this is uh, apparently what Sch Schrodinger was very uh, disturbed by this. So he, he created this, this idea of the wave function describing the quantum system. But he actually, as far as I can understand, thought that it would be a real thing, this wave function. It's that actually we should think of an electron as something as a wave. And then he had to accept, or he was told he has to accept, that when you do a measurement, somehow this wave just bangs, changes into a point. And there's a collapse, and, uh, which he's calling quantum jumping here. Uh, and this is, of course, very disturbing. I mean, it's a very strange picture of reality. Um, there is uh, another issue, which is that this doesn't capture all the actual data contained in a state. Uh, this captures the statistics for, say, the, the position measurement, but in principle, the state tells you statistics of other measurements, too. And these are encoded in things called a phase. Uh, so so the, the picture representation doesn't tell you the full state. Um, there's a, a more kind of uh, intriguing and, and uncommon way of actually visualizing these things. Um, and here I've, I've stolen a slide from, from this guy. I, I kind of emailed him and asked for permission, so I think it's okay. Um, the, um, it, it's this thing called Bohmian mechanics, these uh, pilot waves. Um, so the basic idea is that there are actually, the wave is actually a real thing somehow that guides the particle, and the particle actually has a position. So the particle is a little ball, um, and it's guided by this wave, and that's why you get the interference pattern, because the wave kind of pushes it away from certain places towards others. Um, I, th I think it, it, it's, it's not a completely crazy way of visualizing things. I, I don't really believe that this is the, the way of doing it, but if given how, how problematic some of the other ways are, maybe people should consider this. If you go online, you can also you can find some videos of uh, Bohmian people 
um, actually simulating rather complicated uh, quantum things this way, and there are little, little particles moving around. So it's an interesting one. Um, okay, now I'm going to move towards not talk about visualizing things, but about uh, quantum information. So we had classical bits. Now, then what are quantum bits? Um, so a crucial thing here is that the state, the state matrix is specified by continuous parameters. These are, are complex numbers, so they contain, in general, continuous real numbers. Um, but unfortunately, you might say, uh, you can't store information in these guys. So you can't, if, if you could really encode data in these numbers and actually measure them out, then you could like, store infinite amounts of information in a qubit. But no, uh, what happens is that when we do a measurement, uh, we cannot directly see these numbers because uh, they are basically encoding the probabilities of outcomes. Uh, and if we have, for example, a D by D uh, state matrix, then the best we can do is to distinguish D uh, possible states. Uh, so, for example, this, the, the simplest non-trivial system has d equals 2. And this is what's called a qubit. Because there are two states that you can distinguish, just like the classical bit. Uh, and this is, this is precisely the system that can be, has a state space that can be visualized like this. So normally we take the state here. So this is the state represented by the vector going from here to there. And we take this state to, to represent the value 0 and this state to represent the value 1. So you can see that you, you can store one classical bit in a qubit. You could just say either I prepare this state or that state, and I'm allowed to distinguish these two. That's OK. But it turns out that you can't do better than that. There's something called Holevo's theorem. Uh, and this is, a, I think, a, one of the most important uh, insights from quantum information theory, and it's a kind of a negative one. So I guess that's why it's not mentioned so often. Uh, but if we look more on the, on the kind of positive side, uh, quantum computers. Uh, this is something you can do with, with qubits that pr we think you cannot do with classical bits. Now, okay, what is a computation? So from the perspective of physics, a computer is, is just a physical object. Um, you set some initial state and uh, by feeding it an input, uh, and you let it undergo an evolution, and out, now it's in some other physical state, and you can read off some, some property of that state. So a computer is just a physical system and is governed by physics. Uh, now, so if we want to talk about a quantum computer, what it means is that we imagine ha having a quantum system, uh, and we, we use it to do some, some uh, evolution that, that will turn the state into such a form that it's easy to read off the property that we're interested in. So normally we say we have an n qubit system um, evolving. So the state matrix of this, these n qubits are involving, evolving. Um, and it's drawn like this usually. I don't know if this helps you, but these are different qubits. So there's six qubits in this case. They kind of come in like this is the idea, and then they pass through something that changes the state, and then they come out here, and now you will do your measurements. So what can you do with these sort of evolutions? Well, it's already been mentioned, the, the Shor's algorithm is the most famous one, um, and it, it decomposes, like so already been said, numbers into combinations of, of indivisible prime numbers. Uh, and the cool thing is that it can do this in a reasonable time for large-ish numbers, whereas it would take a classical, the best known classical algorithm, uh, the lifetime of the universe. Uh, we don't actually know, I think someone already mentioned that as well, that, that uh, there is no classical algorithm that can do this. Uh, so you can ask, to what extent can normal classical computers match quantum ones? I think this is one of the really important problems for quantum information theory is to try and, and use, try and find smart tricks for simulating quantum systems using classical computers. 
but they hit this state size problem. Um, and I, as I said, it, this, the state matrix size grows exponentially in the number of systems. And there are many attempts to, to get around this. So I've used a lot of these things a lot called stabilizer states. Uh, they, they can be simulated uh, quite easily on, on, a, on a classical computer, and most of them are maximally entangled, and a lot of the kind of interesting quantum states are, are, are of this type. Uh, there's also something which is very popular now called matrix product states. And these sort of tricks, they work for some classes of states, but not for all. And uh, the, we can't use them to do Shor's algorithm yet. Um, if someone could find a way to do this, um, it, it, would, it would be revolutionary. Uh, and I, I feel like the direction that one should look at if one wants to try to do that is to think of quantum evolutions as random walks on something. Uh, and so the randomness would come from, from the fact that it's a, there's a, it's a random walk. And it's actually not so far from the Bohmian mechanics picture. And there are people working on, on simulating um, quantum computers using Bohmian mechanics along those lines. But the big question is this something, because people, obviously people have tried this already in various ways, and you get stuck. And so you have to do something quite unusual or innovative to make this work. Um, another important thing in quantum information is entanglement. Uh, so this is often introduced as spooky action at a distance, uh, which is, a, uh, I think, the people here for quantum information know that's not true, uh, because there, there is a principle that quantum theory respects, that which says that if I do something here, I cannot change anything observable over there. It's often called non-signaling, or uh, Einstein locality. Um, and quantum theory respects that. Otherwise, it would be a very, very strange world. Uh, so entanglement cannot do that, but it's still very um, interesting and, and mysterious. So I think, it, to me, it start, the reason why we have these kind of things is because of the uncertainty principle, that quantum states can never predict all measurement outcomes with certainty. Uh, now, what can happen is if, if two quantum systems have interacted, then you can get a joint state which has uh, some certainty, like as much certainty as quantum theory allows you to have. But if you do measurements on the individual systems, these measurements can be completely uncertain, completely unpredictable. And uh, these, these sort of states are called entangled. Um, in quantum information, we use them as resources for various things. So there's something called teleportation. And the idea is you can take a quantum state here, including the continuous numbers that specify that state, and you share some entanglement with something over there. And then there's a procedure where you kind of move this state over there without actually sending the system. Uh, you just do measurements here. Uh, and then in the end, somehow magically, the, the state, uh, including the continuous parameters, which is a funny thing, uh, ends up over on the other side. And the, the cost for this is using up the entanglement. Uh, so that's one of the reasons it's called a resource. Is, uh, you can do certain non-local things with it, but you use it up. Uh, my head of group in, in Oxford, he's, he's really into finding entanglement in macroscopic things. And one of the more, uh, is it, the things that ha have piqued the interest of, of the press is, is this thing with the bird navigation. Uh, so there's a model for, for apparently, so these, these are, I think it's called European Robin. And this is not what I work on, but uh, it has, it, it can navigate. Uh, it has a compass built in. And one model for this, to explain how this works, is a kind of quantum chemistry model which involves entanglement uh, and relies on things being entangled. And therefore, people are, are arguing, speculating that um, maybe birds are actually using entanglement to, to navigate. Um, this is part of a wider direction in quantum information now called quantum biology, where you try to find quantum information 
um, notions in biology. It's still, uh, it's still a very new thing, so a lot of people are very skeptical, and uh, I, I think people who work on it will agree that it's, it's still uh, not a solid thing. But it's, it's, an, interest, it's an interesting direction. Um, so, okay, I'll just uh, mention a couple of problems that I, I thought about more specifically. So one was uh, graphs and things to do with graphs because graphs don't, if, if you have a problem formulated as a graph, I think it doesn't have to have this um, dimensionality problem. This. And graphs do appear in, in quantum information in, in certain places. Um, and there is a, so when I started thinking about this graph thing, I, I, I emailed someone called Simone Severini. Uh, who is like uh, the person, or he, he focuses on, on graphs, basically, in quantum information. So I thought I should ask him if he knows about ideas for games, for, for graphs. And he said, well, actually, we're making games. And uh, he's working with this guy, um, Francois Gray, uh, who uh, is, as far as I understand, working full-time on, on this sort of citizen uh, science. And he's trying to, to spread it to... Um, outside of Europe and the US. So he's been sitting a lot in, in Tsinghua in Beijing recently. Um, so these games are, uh, they're apparently going to launch it on, on a hack fest in like a, a month in London. He, he couldn't specify which one it was yet. Um, but the, the first one, the, the main idea has already been mentioned, is graph isomorphism. That somehow being able to tell if two graphs are the same if you twist them out um, is something that humans uh, seem to be good at. I guess it's, it's somehow the same thing as facial recognition if you look at different angles with face. Um, there's also something called, oh, maybe I should just mention, so it's unclear how linked this is to quantum now. Uh, there are beliefs that is uh, understanding this problem will tell you something about uh, sh the simulability of Shor's algorithm, but I, I don't feel like I've, I have thought enough about that to say anything concrete really there. Uh, and Simone says it's not clear. The other one is graph coloring. So you have to color a graph uh, according to certain rules and see if there's a way to actually fill in the whole graph such that these rules are satisfied. And this comes up in, in um, questions concerning whether you can describe a quantum system as a probability distribution on something else. So people often try to describe quantum systems in terms of hidden variables. Uh, and then the counter arguments are sometimes formulated like this thing that you basically, you will find that you cannot consistently assign values to all hidden variables, uh, such that they're consistent with, with what quantum theory predicts. Um, so, I, but I think graphs it seems like a nice, nice direction to look at. Uh, I don't know how to actually, I, I can't tell you a good game now, it's just an idea to raise. Uh, this is a more, it's a little bit of a random one, it's because I'm working a lot on this. And we, it is games. Uh, what happens is, so you're interested, it's actually like a Maxwell's Demon thing, if you've heard of that. So Maxwell's demon is this being that uh, it, it's looking at a thermodynamical system and it has some insider knowledge. It knows uh, some extra things about the actual state of the system uh, and it uses that to extract work. Now you can ask a more general question saying, if my knowledge is about the system is represented by some general state, um, so if I know a lot, the state will be uh, less uncertain. If I know little, this will be more uncertain. Now, how much work can I get out uh, if I, say, take this to, to some randomized thermal state, for example? Now, the way we tackle this is that we, we define a game. So we say there's some rules that you're allowed to use to extract work. Uh, and basically it's going to be that, in this case, that you can either couple to the heat bath, a temperature T, 
or you can couple to a battery, a work reservoir. Uh, so you have some initial state, which I don't know if I should explain what this means. These are, these are energy levels and occupation probabilities of being at different energy levels. And the energy levels may change and occupation probabilities may change. And you can ask how much work can I get going from this to that? And we call this quantity the W of, of rho going to, to sigma. Uh, and what happens is you have very simple rules, uh, like, like just these two steps. But you can combine them in any sequence you want, and it gets very complicated. Uh, so you could imagine games where, where you know, people need to work out what is the best strategy for extracting work. Um, is, is this a, do, do ask if, if something's unclear. So, and then I was, when I was preparing for this one, I think it was only this morning that it appeared to me that this, this is the question that really clicks with me most concerning games uh, and quantum information. And it's basically, you know, can we use uh, games to work out the right way of visual, or a good way, an acceptable way of, of visualizing quantum systems? Um, so to me, this is like the biggest reason why I'm, I'm doing research on quantum theory is probably that I, I feel that like there must be some way of visualizing reality, of visualizing the quantum reality, but we just haven't found it because probably because we're so biased by classical mechanics, and we're trying to force these classical mechanical notions like systems and momentum and position onto these quantum things. But if we had just seen the quantum things, uh, the quantum effects, uh, without knowing all these other things, uh, how would we have thought about them? What sort of concepts would have been natural to use then? So maybe you can use a game to see how people would react to that. So you don't try and explain it in a classical mechanical setting, you just show them somehow the actual experimental uh, things that you see. And then you ask, uh, well, so they, they would have to uh, somehow try to identify patterns in these things, and, on, and the more they can predict what's gonna happen, the better they do in the game, something like that. And then you can uh, basically hope that they will come up with some notions, some intuitive notions for how to play this game. And these could form the basis for, for a new set of concepts for, for quantum effects. Um, so I, I don't know what image to put there, so it's just a question mark. <laughs> um, I think that was it, yeah. Thank you.